Okay, afternoon everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for um, the Early Career Research Cancer Showcase uh, as part of the Genomics and Research Seminars. Um, so my name is Prabs. Um, I am Director of Clinical Data and Imaging here at Genomics England, and I am a chair for this afternoon session. So we have um, five, five great talks this afternoon uh, who are all defined as early career researchers. I'll go through each speaker as they kind of come up to do their talk and tell you a little bit about their story. Uh, as part of this series as well, we're also doing a blog post post. Um, so Golistan Karami has given us um, a bit of a blog and a bit of an insight into her background, her research, um, and what it's like in terms of work that we have to the, our participants who have donated our data to us. Um, and this is a series that we're highlighting the kind of the rise of the early career researchers within the GSIP um, and how we as well support those. So there is a link on the website there as well for you to join and have a read of that. Um, so it is the summer holidays and everyone goes off to somewhere warm and nice hopefully it will also be warm here in england at some point uh, so we're taking a couple of months off as a hiatus um at the the one for september uh, we're actually there is a research summit called GERS, which i'll talk about in a second so actually the next time we're going to do this research seminar is at the end of october so 31st of october halloween base so i'm sure we can come up with numerous puns relating to Halloween and all the weird and wonderful of Halloween. Okay, um, and then <clears throat> Sam, next slide. So uh, the really interesting bit is the Genomics England Research Summit, uh, which is happening in London this year in Business Design Centre in Angel. Uh, that is on the 19th of September. Um, we would invite you to register. The agenda is live. Uh, how many of you can? So do join the waitlist and have a look at the agenda. Uh, it really does look really interesting to one on cancer, one on rare disease, and also emerging technologies. So we've got some really interesting talks um, and some really interesting people coming to talk on the day. So um, have a look at the agenda and join us if you can. Okay, so we are going to have the first of our talks. So the first person talking is Kirsten Toll, who is talking, the presentation is called Mutational Processes and Genomic Aberrations Driving Cancer Evolution in 1011 Lung Tumours. Uh, Kirsten is a third year PhD student uh, in Nikki McGranahan's lab at UCL uh, with a background in cancer bioinformatics. Um, her research focuses on exploring and interrogating mutational purposes and chromosomal aberrations in lung cancer evolution using whole genome sequencing. Kirsten, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Um, I hope everyone can see my screen. Um, yeah, so thank you for the organizers um, for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, my talk will focus on mutational processes and cancer genes in lung tumors. Um, so why are we interested in lung cancer? Um, lung cancer remains to be the leading cancer related cause of death globally. And um, over the years, outcome of lung cancer patients has not improved drastically. And therefore we need to get a better understanding of what is driving this disease. And we think that one avenue to understanding what is driving lung cancer is by looking beyond the exome because most previous studies have relied on whole exome sequencing but really only about 1% of the genome is comprised of protein coding sequences. But now what if a driver mutation occurs in the remaining parts of the genome, but we just can't see them? So for this, um, we think we need to illuminate the whole genome, including the functional elements, which are not protein coding. And to do this, uh, we used 1011 lung tumor samples, which were whole genome sequenced as part of the gel data set. And this cohort includes eight histological subtypes and also includes some unpaired metastasis samples. So in the study, we wanted to explore the extent of genomic aberrations in lung tumors, try to unravel in which genes uh, mutations are positively selected for, and also explore the mutational processes that sculpted the genomes of these lung tumors, and when during the course of tumor evolution, genomic aberrations occurred. So first, we examined the extent to which lung tumor genomes are disrupted. And we found that lung tumors are highly aberrant when we compare this to the single nucleotide variant mutation burden of our lung tumors um, compared to the pan-cancer average. 
And we noticed that the degrees of aberration differ based on the histology of the tumor, uh, with carcinoids on the very left, having the lowest mutation burden per megabase and large cell tumors the highest. But then we also wanted to understand which of these mutations were actually positively selected for and could possibly have a cancer driver functionality. So to do this, there are several methods that can estimate if mutations in a certain gene were positively selected for. And now going back to whole exome sequencing, what is usually done um, is to evaluate the excess of non-synonymous mutations in the exons. But we have whole genome sequencing, so we can also look at the excess of mutations in the non-coding parts of the genome. And then another different method to look at selection is to estimate the functional impact um, that a mutation might have. So for this, we implemented and combined five tools, which are based on these principles, to derive a list of putative coding and also non-coding lung cancer genes using our cohort of 1,011 lung tumors. And here I'm showing the list of protein coding genes, which were positively selected for in our cohort. And we can see that, for example, TP53 on the very left um, was mutated in approximately 350 tumors um, of various histologies, which is shown by the colored bar plot. And then we can see that TP53 was significantly selected for in all histological subgroups, except for mesothelioma, which is indicated by those gray and black squares at the bottom. And then when we extended this analysis to the non-coding parts of the genome, we got a large list of putative gene elements, which may have a cancer driver functionality when mutated. And when we then compared the coding genes and the non-coding gene elements, we found that coding genes are mutated at a higher frequency, but here we detect fewer genes. The non-coding gene elements, on the other hand, are mutated at a lower frequency, but um, here we detect more gene elements and also more gene elements um, that haven't previously been associated with cancer before, which are those gene names in red. And um, we also perform power calculations and we are able to pick up so many non-coding cancer gene elements due to the large size of this cohort that we're analyzing. So using this gene list, we were able to quantify how many putative driver mutations we detect in each tumor. And here I'm showing the number of um, coding driver mutations on the x-axis and the number of non-coding um, mutations on the y-axis. The size of the circle indicates the number of tumors with this many driver mutations. And so we detected a subset of tumors in which we weren't able to pinpoint any driver mutations so far. And then also subsets um, in which we only found non-coding driver mutations. Now, having observed all of these mutations and their potential to drive lung tumor evolution, we wanted to understand which mutational processes sculpted the cancer genome. Because we know that endogenous and exogenous mutational processes and also errors in the DNA replication machinery can result in mutations in the genome, which you can then observe in the DNA after sequencing. So mutation, uh, using mutation signature deconvolution, we can then begin to unravel which mutational processes were active during the evolutionary past of the tumor, because different patterns of mutations in the DNA have been previously linked to different biological processes so that we can sort of use these mutation signatures as a microscope to look at the mutation processes that sculpted the genome. We then applied this method to an array of different mutations and genomic aberrations. So we started off with um, single base substitutions, but we expanded this to then also look at the distribution of mutations across the genome, and then also double base substitutions, indels, copy number, and structural variant, variants, um, which you can see in this quite colorful plot. And here, every column is uh, one tumor, and the colored bars represent the percentage of mutations that can be attributed um, to an array of mutation signatures. And when we then grouped this by lung tumor histology, it became apparent that different mutation processes are active in distinct histologies. So one such difference um, that I wanted to highlight is that in adenocarcinomas, we detect a lot of the signature SBS4 in light green, which describes mutations that are associated with tobacco smoking. And in squamous cell tumors, um, we see also SBS4, but in addition to that, we also detect SBS92 represented in dark green, which is also associated with tobacco smoking. When we then had a look at the mutation profiles of these two signatures, we can see that they comprise different nucleotide changes. We think that this may either be due to intrinsic differences of the two histologies, or that there are different active compounds of tobacco smoke um, 
or possibly that one of these signatures describes mutations acquired due to tobacco smoking and the other describes errors in the repair of smoking induced mutations. And so now this led us to explore further um, genomic differences in those tumors with and without a smoking signature. And when we integrated mutations with copy number aberrations, we can work out if a copy number gain or loss of heterozygosity event happened earlier or later during tumor evolution. And so here what I'm showing is the proportion of adenocarcinoma tumors that harbor a smoking signature and that have an early copy number gain at a given position across the genome. And when we compare this to the proportion of tumors without a smoking signature, we see some difference. And we can furthermore do the same analysis for loss of heterozygosity events in tumors with a smoking signature and the, those tumors without a smoking signature. And we saw that um, a higher proportion of tumors with a smoking signature have early copy number gains in chromosome ARM5P, uh, where the third genus, and for loss of heterozygosity events, a higher proportion of tumors without a smoking signature harbor early losses on 1P, um, where NRAS and NOTCH2 are located. And so to conclude, um, we saw that the degrees of genomic disruption differ based on lung tumor histology. We detected putative novel coding and also non-coding lung cancer genes. We detected an array of mutational signatures in our cohort and saw that different mutational processes are active in distinct histologies. And lastly, that um, tumors with and without a smoking signature vary in terms um, of their timing of acquisition of copy number events. Um, and yeah, with that, I'd like to thank um, all of you for listening and also the patients and their families and all of our funders for making this possible. Um, and yeah, as well as to everyone in the McGranahan and Swanton labs, um, and yeah, my PhD supervisor, Nikki, and also Maria in the lab, who's done a lot of the coding and non-coding cancer gene discovery analysis. Happy to take any questions. Cool. Thank you very much, Kirsten. That was an amazing presentation. Um, so you can either raise your hand and we can unmute you miraculously, um, or you can put some questions in the chat. Um, so if you do have any questions, uh, feel free to put your hands up um, and Sam or Zan will unmute you. Um, so Kirsten, it's quite interesting that you've got uh, in from lung cancers, there are there's adeno, there's squamous, and there's adenosquamous. I think your N numbers for adenosquamous was not a huge amount, but it's interesting to understand, do you think there's enough data from what you've seen to distinguish that as a sub-cohort? Because I think diagnostically they become quite an odd cohort to manage and treat and then diagnose. Do you think you've got enough information here to kind of take, take, take that away? Yeah, so so far we yeah, we don't have too many of the adenosquamous tumors. Mm. Um so it's it's quite difficult to make any conclusion based yeah. on 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 this these numbers that we have. But so far we have been analyzing them separately. Well, mm. because they are yeah, distinct to the adenocarcinomas or just the squamous cell tumor. So we didn't want to um include them there. We just thought we'd analyze them separately to see do we find anything um interesting yeah. in this kind of small cohort. Yeah. Very cool. Okay, uh, Thanos has put one question. I think we've got a minute, so we'll ask. So Thanos has put, uh, how is the timing of acquisition of CNV events assessed? Um, yeah, so we, we're using a tool that basically um, uh, is, is based on a, on a published tool uh, from, from the Peacock study, where we can yeah. use the um, mutations um, and in relation with the copy number to then understand whether the copy number event occurred before or after a whole genome uh, doubling event happened. Um, yeah, that would be kind of the short answer, but I'm also happy to, to follow up on that um, and discuss in, in, in more detail. Yeah, that, that might be quite cool. Um, so John, oh, we're going to go 30 seconds because it's John. So um, John has asked, uh, how did your non-coding variants compare in frequency slash over-representation uh, to e.g. A ter ter as a positive control? Uh, any standout as equally strong? Um, yeah, so TERT is, is a very strong, uh, strong one, that's true. Yeah, so the non-coding um, gene elements Overall, we have fewer mutations there yeah. um, compared to the coding um, coding genes. Um, so yeah, but TURD is definitely one of the strong ones that we do detect, yeah. Okay, cool. There is a further question, Kirsten, from in the chat, which I might leave you to type a response to. 
uh, about yeah, sure. epi epigenetic effects of smoking lung tumors. But uh, thank you very much for your presentation, Kirsten. Um, amazing thank to see you all. Well. So great to see. Uh, List is Golis Rani. Um, so her presentation is called Towards Translation of Radio Genomics into the Clinic, Building a Pipeline that Combines Classic and Deep Learning Methods Using Genomic Information as a Multi-Parametric MRI. Uh, so Golisan is a uh, applied machine learning researcher. Uh, she's actually in one of my groups here in jail. Um, her research focuses on building a pipeline that combines classic and deep learning methods using medical imaging and genomics information for translation into clinical settings. Um, okay, Colossan, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much and uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for being here. And I'm really happy uh, to have an opportunity to talk with you about this um, exciting and cutting edge field, uh, which has a potential to uh, bring to clinic from the research. So uh, what uh, I would like to say, Today we are going to talk and discuss about the uh, discuss about the yes uh, discuss about the steps required to bring the technology from the research to the uh, uh, pot potential clinical application. Yeah, the next. Um, so uh, very briefly, if I want to talk about what is the research and what is the uh, problem statement and which kind of the method we are going to uh, follow, it just I would like just to say uh, I'm working with the glioblastoma, one of the um, most common malignant brain tumor, around 50% of the glioma. And uh, uh, according to the guideline, uh, the standard of the care treatment for the, this kind of the uh, uh, tumor, glioblastoma, uh, is uh, uh, radiotherapy uh, plus uh, uh, adjuvant uh, temozolamide with uh, maximum resection of the tumor. But uh, uh, despite of the uh, uh, very, um, I mean, and still the survival uh, uh, are, is very uh, low, around uh, 14 months among these patients. So uh, this days that the new technique like immunotherapy, immunotherapy is very uh, interesting and showing some promising results. So, but however, uh, not all glioblastoma will respond to the, this kind of the treatment. So what we are going to do, we are trying to find the immunobiomarker which can help us to find a patient which probably respond to this kind of the treatment. And uh, we, uh, we will find a kind of the, which kind of the approach, uh, immuno, uh, immuno tre treatment approach we have to apply for this patient because we are having different type of the immunotherapy like uh, cortisol, like vaccine. Uh, so uh, we need to find out also which kind of the approaches uh, fit with the patient. Okay, the next. Uh, so uh, what what we are having for uh, running this kind of the uh, uh, method, we are having the multimodal data. Uh, we know that when we uh, when we I mean any patient is come starting with I mean with the tumor, they are they are being acquired with different type of the uh, data like clinical information, including gender age, uh, tumor resection, tumor location, and also radiology, mostly with the MRI because we are working with a tumor brain tumor, the radiology. MRI is one of the gold standard to uh, diagnose treatment and also monitoring the patients. And also we are uh, having the pathology slides. We are having the whole genome sequence data, genomic data. So it's a kind of the, we are, uh, we are um, receiving the uh, rich source of the information. Uh, which we, we expect that each of them can give us uh, information regarding the, uh, the, the tumor and the, the patient situation and uh, the patient outcome. But how we can like all get, I mean, uh, put all together and then reach one, uh, which reach the end of the, and then say the patient response or not. The way we have to uh, follow is a kind of recurrent multimodal and with machine learning mo uh, model. So uh, for the first step, I'm going to work and prepare the radiology slide. Sorry, can you go to the next slide? 
So, uh, so we are going to like uh, using the radiology slides. Usually, as I said, we are working with MRI. So we need to like uh, find out uh, which kind of the images, which kind of the sequences, which part, where is the annotation, the segment, the tumor segmentation, and which kind of the feature we have to uh, uh, extract from the tumor, from the images. So uh, when we start working with the uh, MRI images, as we are working with the multi-parametric MRI, like uh, multi-sequence, and says not just one serial, serial, uh, serial image. So we need to like do some uh, pre-processing step. First of all, we need to find out all the patient has the same sequences. And then without the like um, uh, um, uh, movement, any artifacts. And then the next step, we have to like uh, prepare the uh, slides. They are having the different uh, uh, resolution. They are having the, um, uh, the, the, the different size. So we have to like extract the skull from the tumor, from the uh, brain uh, uh, normal tissue. And also we have to register the images. We have to fill, uh, apply field correction and, and at the end normalization of the, all the data. So uh, after uh, preparing the data, we have the next step, which is annotation. We need to find the, where is the tumor, where is the different uh, component, tumor component, like necrosis, like enhanced part of the enhancement or edema. So we have to annotate all those uh, area as well. So now we, after this is the, we, we reach this point, we are going to like train a model with a machine and extract the features from all those images. So we, uh, we are following two different methods to extract features. One method is a classical, uh, or Radiomax classic feature extraction. In this uh, me uh, me <clears throat> method, we are extracting the classical features like whole tumor volume, sorry, uh, like a feature in the first order class, like a standard uh, deviation, a mean value, all those things, uh, first order uh, features. And then shape features like the, uh, the, the tumor shape. And the last features we are extracting is the texture features. So uh, then what the, the good point about the classic features is we know which kind of the features we are extracting. So then later we are, when we are correlating these features with the output, we can find out which kind of the uh, features will more be significant. And we, we can uh, uh, kind of interpret the result and say which kind of the reason could be for this uh, <laughs> behavior. And then uh, the next, uh, method which I am uh, using is a kind of uh, extracting D features. In this model, we just have to feed the whole images to the network, neuronal network. And then neuronal network start to reading the image, uh, applying some features, extracting features, and will be trained and learn about the image and extract the features, which we really don't know which kind of the features they are at the end. We just get the like the, the, the features value without knowing which kind of the features they are. So uh, now we are uh, extracting features from the public data set, from the one cover data set, uh, uh, from sorry, from the um, training data set. And then we after that, we combine these two di different types of the features and uh, run again a new classifier to uh, class to classify the features. Uh, uh, remove some of those uh, uh, less uh, interesting features and then a, a kind of the uh, feature reduction and then apply the uh, classifier to classify these features into different group. Can you go to the next step? So, uh, so we, we, we find that our model, uh, how with uh, uh, kind of the public data set discovery cohort, we apply the uh, feature of images and with five-fold cross-validation, we get the, the uh, I mean, a kind of the first step of the, the, the model. Now, what we have to do, if we want to like uh, extract features from the genomic in England, uh, we have to use this train feature, train model, which we already using with the uh, discovery cohort to extract the, uh, Mm, classical and also deep features from the images. And also, uh, we after extracting features from genomic in gland as unseen data set, or we can say, we can say like replication cohort, uh, we are also having the classifier. Uh, so we, uh, with that classifier, which we use it to the classify feature, classi classification features, we also classify the 
um, uh, genomic data, uh, those uh, features extracted from the genomic data. So at the end, uh, can you go to the next, sorry? I'm sorry, yeah, it's okay. Uh, yeah, it's a late, okay. So, uh, sorry, can you go to the next slide? Uh, okay, so, um, again, the next, I don't want, as I am, okay, so, uh, after uh, extracting features from the images, we have to extract features from genomic data. Uh, what, I, what I'm using, I'm using the DNA, RNA sequencing data. So uh, for preparing this, uh, uh, this um, uh, also the kind of pipeline or um, uh, repo we are, we are using, we have to follow some steps like quality control, clustering the uh, uh, cells, and then uh, if, um, a dimension reduction technique, we are uh, we are uh, using the, the clustering PCA to like uh, uh, reduction the dimension of the uh, feature uh, genomic uh, data and also we are applying the T uh, TSNE to uh, clustering the cells and then after that I am extracting the <clears throat> most significant uh, genomic from the each for each clusters. Can you go with the next one? So here we are we are getting the each clusters. And, uh, and around 14 clusters and each cluster, we are getting the most uh, significant features, genomic expression, gen expression features. And then based on the, uh, the feature, they, based on the one of the uh, uh, like uh, uh, gen genes, we can like uh, rename the cell, cluster cells and say which, which type of the cell they are. Can you get the next one, sorry? And the next, just want to finish it. So now we got it here. We, we are having the clinical, we are having the radiomas and genomic also. We extract, we are having the, uh, some uh, uh, significant information from the whole genome sequence like uh, MGMT uh, gen copy number, gene copy number, or like uh, uh, whole genomic uh, doubling. So now we are having all this data. So we just needed to run uh, one Cox regression and find uh, uh, two different uh, uh, group like responder and non-responder. And then the next, but we, we have to consider some challenges and limitations when we are going to run uh, this kind of the model. First of all, for one of them is longitudinal MR. We needed to like have to follow the, this kind of the data because uh, just uh, we need to find out which kind of the treatment the patient are receiving, like whole uh, tumor resection, just biopsy, or how is it? And also we need to define the, the progression. So the progression, uh, um, progression free survival, all this information when we are going to run the model. And we need also to advance MRI, like, uh, uh, so uh, sorry, uh, like diffusion because uh, diffusion perfusion give us information regarding cellularity and geogenesis, which is uh, telling us more uh, for more data about that uh, tumor type. And also uh, number of the patient is very challenging when we are running the deep model, because uh, uh, when usually when we are working with the medical images or uh, uh, in, in like in healthcare, we are having a small sample of the data. So the model cannot see all type of the images is one of the, the reason we cannot really get a good or general model. And also we are using multi-site MRI data. So it's a kind of a, a, another challenge for, uh, uh, for preparing the data because uh, different machine, different uh, imaging parameter, uh, different sequences all change the uh, pixel value, which are, we are using to extract features. So domain adaptation maybe can help us later. And also we need to consider that which kind of the treatment patient they are, they are receiving. They hold just a standard treatment or chemo and or neoadjuvant treatment also. We need to ca be careful with this issue. And now then at the end, DNA and RNA expression is one of the most important things to like follow the immuno uh, biomarker. And so, uh, so at the end- just, um, yes. Colison, do you mind if we just pause there? And I, I know you want to say thank you to everyone, but we are running a little bit over time. Yeah, so what I'm going to do is there are a couple of messages and questions in the chat. If I can leave them with you to pick up um, and I'm going to be very rude. I know that I'm really sorry, but we oh, are behind. So sorry, so, I just, okay. um, it is great to hear your talk uh, and it is a unique role that you're doing because you're covering a link between ourselves and the glioma GC. It is a very unique project and it'd be great for you to talk a bit, a bit more about that. Um, so, yeah, if you guys can follow um, Colossan's blog as well, that'd be great to show. Okay, so moving on, and uh, thank you very much for that.
So the next talk is Suandani Raman Narayan. Uh, I hope I've got that right. I'm sorry if that's a pretty awful present like way of saying that. But uh, your talk is on can mutations in the non-protein non-protein coding dark matter of our genome drive tumor genesis. So this is insights from 16,000 genomics England tumors. Um, so Anthony is a PhD researcher at the University College in Dublin, Ireland, um, and it, as she's co-funded by SI, SFI CRT Genomics Data Science and MSCA Integrate to study the role of long non-coding RNAs in cancer by using somatic mutation data from tumor whole genomes. Uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I'll just share my slides quickly. I hope you can all see this. Um, uh, we can, yeah. So I'll just be talking about, sorry for the really long title, but I'll just be talking about discovering cancer drivers in the non-coding genome. So uh, I think Kirsten has already introduced this topic very well um, and how whole genome sequence can actually help us discover this. But I'll just walk you through the introduction just for the sake of flow. So um, we know that normal cells acquire mutation over time, and most of these mutations are neutral in their effect. But at certain point, a uh, mutation can arise such that uh, it can now enhance the fitness of the cell, leading to uncontrollable growth or that catalysis uh, from Peacock data set, which had about 2,500 whole genome sequences. We know that more than 90% of the, but we don't really know what they're doing there. And from studies have focused on protein coding genes. So in, again, in the Peacock data set analysis, uh, there, were, there were about 150 cancer drivers discovered, and you can see that they're validated cancer drivers, but you see that a very small, small little about them. So this study actually uh, concluded that non-coding drivers are rare in the first place. Um, so in our lab, we focus on long non-coding RNAs or link RNAs, as I shall be calling them from now on. So link RNAs are RNA molecules of length uh, 200 nucleotides uh, or longer, and they do not have any ORF, that is, they do not code for any proteins. So link RNAs are known to function in the cell by interacting with other biomacromolecules such as RNA, DNA, and proteins. Uh, and link RNAs have been previously implicated in cancer as oncogenes and tumor suppressors, and they're also tissue cancer type uh, specific in terms of their expression. So the main question that I'm trying to ask here is if mutations in link RNAs can actually alter tumor cell fitness. Um, so we have evidence uh, in a, you know, this uh, analysis used data from Peacock, and we were able to derive like a map of RNAs across different cancer types. And what this study actually managed to achieve is to and to see if the mutations what we want. So with genomics England, we have access to sixteen thousand tumors, and we plan to run the same software that was used in this. Uh, in the previous uh, analysis with for signals of positive selection. And this can be in terms of uh, mutation burden or functional impact. And what we hope to achieve here is that with Genomics England, uh, we hope to see a greater number of cancer driver link RNA simply because it is, it will allow, it will increase our statistical power in a sense. So you can see that the number of SNVs that are available with Genomics England is 12 times of what was there with Peacock and with Peacock. So mag, which has about 16,000 uh, tumor genomes. And I'm doing some filtering on it in terms of samples, SNVs, and the regions analyzed so that uh, I can actually detect signal and to also sort of see which filtering method fits uh, out of detail here. But on y-axis, we just have the precision. And I'm using protein coding genes as my ground truth because we know more about protein coding genes 
see that in some cases I achieve like 70% precision. So I'm just taking these on non-coding drivers. So with uh, 13 cancer types, we discover about 41 cancer driver link RNAs. And uh, these numbers are a bit too small, but uh, you can see that we detect map and discover a, yes, greater signal in cohorts that have as about 1,500. So what CLC3 genes are just a literature curated set of cancer associated. The enrichment is more than what you would expect by an end of chance with protein coding genes just as a sanity check to see if our analysis is in different cancer types. Uh, this is for protein coding genes. And since we know more about them, we can put together a false positive list and use the known cancer consensus gene cancer gene consensus list to see if you're actually detecting a uh, signal. So here again, you can see that for the filtering type method that we've chosen, we see a good signal from the known list and a low rate of false positive detection. Uh, so that's it for now. I will be focusing on trying to fix the method that we want to use to detect these cancer driver link RNAs, and I will take the candidate list further to understand their properties much better in terms of is there like, uh, are, do they share common properties in terms of gene length, GC content, the expression divergence from other data sets that are available, also to look at survival analysis and to functionally validate these SMBs uh, that we see in the link RNAs that we detect as cancer drivers. Uh, so thank you everyone for listening and thank you for the, thank you to the organizers for this opportunity. And I'd like to thank my supervisor and my funding uh, from SFI and Mercury. Thank you. Okay, cool. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, we're pushing on time a little bit. Maybe if there's one question, I might see if we've got anything. So uh, there is one question, if that's right. Uh, Ramin has asked, can these cancer drivers turn to passengers? Uh, how many cancer drivers turn passengers? Sorry, um, do not. Yeah, fair point. Okay, we will, Ramin, if you can add a little bit more context to that, uh, we could ask um, Sanandani to, uh, yeah. Type, type an answer in, in the chat if that's okay but thank you very much for your presentation I uh, really appreciate your time and great to see your work okay thank you. uh, so moving on to the fourth of five talks uh, we have Robert Scott um, and Robert is going to talk to us about the analysis of copy number and structural variation associated to cancer predisposition in the pan cancer cohort of genomics England uh, so Rob is uh, a PhD student as well in bioinformatics with a specialization in computational cancer genomics. Uh, his current work and interests are mainly focused on the analysis of cancer-related germline structural variants within the 100,000 Genomes Project. Rob, the floor is yours. I, yeah, just checking everyone. You can see my, um, my screen and everything? Uh, yeah, okay. Cool, cool. Um, yep, so... Uh, I, yeah, I'm Rob, um, and as has uh, been mentioned, I, I work on um, uh, hereditary uh, large variants and finding associations um, between germline uh, large variants uh, and cancer risk uh, in the Genomics England cohort. Uh, to give a little bit of background, um, we know that there is a, a significant knowledge gap in the heritability of cancers, and when we talk about heritability in this case it's the proportion of the phenotypic uh, trait that can be accounted for by genetic variation so in this case uh, hereditary cancer risk um, and depending on the cancer uh, common SNPs um, are estimated to account for between uh, 10 and 50 percent of the heritability of cancer you see on the uh, far right of uh, this uh, graph uh, here, there's um, the uh, common SNPs only account for about 10% of the her heritability of breast cancer. Um, and because of this, uh, our, um, uh, sorry, skipping ahead there, um, 
so we know that there are uh, other um, variants that uh, account for a large chunk of the variability in uh, the human genome. Um, and it's with current research is becoming pretty evident that there are large variants, that are copy number variants, um, that are associated with disease risk. And when you compare the size of um, a copy number variants and structural variants to point mutations, uh, they do cover uh, more of the genome um, than the sum total of uh, point mutations. Uh, and it's because of this uh, that the hypothesis for my project is that a significant proportion of the missing heritability uh, of these cancers can be attributed to large variants. And so the aims for this project have been to use the 100,000 Genomes Project to define a matched cancer and control cohort um, just from the uh, germline um, uh, whole genome sequencing data in uh, Genomics England, um, and then to uh, create a pipeline to uh, uh, extract and compare um, the frequency of these variants between our um, cancer and match controls. Um, so to start with, <laughs> I had to build um, a cancer and control cohort. Um, and we started with uh, the control. And this was built from the rare disease cohort um, uh, in Genomics England. Uh, and um, there, there are quite a few steps that I probably won't be able to go over uh, today just for sake of time. Uh, but the gist of it is that it was a, uh, a sequence of filtering steps to remove um participants that were likely to be um associated with a higher risk of um uh, of cancer so there are a, a few rare disease uh, uh a few syndromes and rare diseases in this cohort that are associated with increased risk of cancer so we had to remove those um to have this uh control uh and this uh overall left us with 16,151 um, control participants that we could match to our um, cancer cohort, um, which uh, we then defined um, as um, the subset of the cancer cohort that had uh, uh, primary tumors um, was more frequent than 200 um, uh, tumors across the, the 100,000 Genomes Project. Um, and uh, subsetted down to just European partic participants. Uh, and this left us with 11,676 um, cancer, uh, cancer participants. Um, and from there, uh, I built this pipeline. Um, uh, it's always a bit hard to show. Um, it's difficult to show just a li lines of code, but um, uh, it broadly separated into three uh, like three um, sections. The first was to um, uh, pull uh, uh, all the large variant data um, and to uh, algorith algorithmically match um, uh, each cancer participant to a um, to three um, control participants. So we did. Uh, uh, our analysis on a pan-cancer basis and uh, on a cancer-by-cancer -cancer basis. Um, and once we had our um, cancer and match control, um, we, uh, or I binned the genome um, and intersected the um, uh, high-quality copy number variant data um, for both the cancer and control to find um, the rate of CNVs per window uh, of the genome uh, between the cancer and control. And from there, we could uh, compute uh, the significance and correct for multiple hypothesis testing. And this gave us uh, a number of significant bins um, that could um, then be matched with uh, the structural variant data to see the co-localization of copy number variants and structural variants. Um, and uh, I can't go through all the cancers, but so this is the breast cancer 
our results. I kind of, um, I just like to draw your attention to um, this top bin and bottom bin, um, also highlighted on the Manhattan plot. Um, so LOP 408186 is a um, a promoter region for killer T cell receptors, and we see a consistent um, a deletion uh, in this uh, in this region. Um, and enemy seven is also um, a th a theorized um, uh, oncogene uh, for breast cancer. Uh, and we also see this pattern uh, pan cancer, and we see a number of patterns uh, depend. Uh, cancer dependent, but this is um, uh, a pattern that we do also see pan cancer. Um, and interestingly, for enemy seven, when we look at uh, a combination of copy number variants and structural variants, um, we see uh, in this graph in the uh, top bit, this is um, the regions uh, which are deleted. Uh, in copy number variants in our breast cohort, um, and the regions that are deleted by structural variant. Um, and we see, uh, sorry, the, so this green box is uh, enemy seven, um, the, the span of the gene. And we see um, pretty consistent deletions uh, across, uh, across the gene. Um, and so in summary, um, we've, uh, found a, no uh, a number of novel candidate loci that um, are st uh, statistically, statistically significantly associated with cancer risk. Um, our SV analysis is uh, still ongoing and showing uh, further regions of interest, and we're currently also validating our results in an independent cohort that's ongoing. And I'd just like to thank um, the Contino lab, uh, everyone works there, uh, Jim Marco as well for supervising, and Michelle, our collaborator in the US, who's helped out a lot. Uh, thanks all for listening. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, Jim Marco, I think you're on as well. Great work to see that you're doing. Um, if it's okay, Rob, we are kind of getting towards time. I will ask for a few questions in the chat if that's okay, to just keep the ball rolling. Um, but great talk, and um, thank you for coming to show us what you've been doing. Okay, um, next on, and last but by no means least, is Ben. Um, so Ben Shum is, a, is going to talk to us about the genomic correlate to melanoma outcomes following first-time immune checkpoint inhibition. Uh, so Ben is a medical oncologist with an interest in immuno-oncology and melanoma. Um, he completed his medical degree at the University of Melbourne, um, and has since worked as a clinical research fellow at the Renal Skin Unit at the Royal Marsden. Uh, and Ben is currently taking an MD, I think you call it brackets MD res, isn't it, Ben? Uh, under supervision of uh, SAMRA um, and studying the mechanisms of response and resistance to immuno oncology therapies in melanoma. Ben, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, perhaps, for having me and, and I suppose for the committee for selecting uh, this talk. Just uh, checking, can you see the full presentation or is it the notes? Uh, I could be naughty and say I can see the notes, but I'm not. Um, I can see the full <laughs> I mean, there's probably not much going on behind it anyway. Okay, so we'll kick off. Um, so thanks very much. Um, so just by way of background, um, you know, melanoma is obviously a very common cancer in the UK with increasing incidence. Uh, and what is uh, what is remarkable about melanoma, though, is that it's become the poster child for immune checkpoint inhibitions, uh, which have transformed the uh, prognosis of advanced melanoma and is really now the first line standard of care therapy. Um, I think, you know, I remember remember about 10, 15 years ago when, you know, if you had advanced melanoma, your prognosis would probably be at about six to 12 months. But now, you know, the uh, median prognosis is about uh, six years. Uh, however, um, 50% of patients still don't benefit, as we can see on this cup of my curve here. Um, and there's really a lack of biomarkers to predict prognosis or treatment response. Um, and so, you know, at the clinic, um, you know, level, you know, we don't we, we don't really have a good idea in terms of, you know, who will benefit and who won't. And so there's been a number of, you know, translational studies that have um, tried to use, uh, utilize predictive biomarkers um, as sort of listed in this table here. And I'll just sort of draw your eye to 
to you know the green lines here, which I think are, are the ones that are standing uh, sort of uh, setting the bar, which is a tumor mutational burden, a combination of TMB and the interference signature uh, score using a couple of these studies with a predictive value of about an AUC of 0.83, 0.84. However, my sort of argument for this is that really, you know, whilst these uh, predictors are, you know, compelling and interesting, uh, I really think that, you know, the uh, the genome is really underutilized here because all they use is just quanti uh, quantification of the tumor mutational burden. Um, and so this is, I suppose, where gel comes in. Um, and, you know, within gel and melanoma cohort, we've got a cohort of about 300 melanoma patients, um, uh, most of which were uh, had their samples excised in the stage three or four uh, disease setting, some of which then went on to metastatic disease and subsequent systemic therapy and response assessment. Um, and so as part of, you know, uh, this effort, um, what we also did was uh, a big collaborative effort across, um, you know, all the across the GSIP and across all of the GMCs across the UK that have contributed um, uh, uh, patients and samples to this. And also, you know, a big um, ups to, you know, the gel team, including Prabs and Kate and Georgia, and of course, Tareem and Anna, uh, who have since left um, for, you know, helping facilitate and bring this together, because I think it is really uh, a lot of this clinical data that has facilitated us um, in bringing together some, you know, really uh, interesting insights and correlations to come. And so, you know, to sort of uh, bring this together, uh, so what we have, what I'm going to talk about today is really this orange part um, here where we've got a subset of patients that underwent, um, uh, that unfortunately developed metastatic disease and subsequently underwent first line immunotherapy um, and for which we also have response data really uh, processed uh, the bioinformatics data, but has been also been great in sharing insights and ideas. Um, and so this is just a um, overview of the gel melanoma um, first line cohort in terms of, you know, the, the subtypes. And I think the, the key uh, sort of uh, point I'd like to draw here is that um, quite nicely, our um, cohort recapitulates um, similar response rates and uh, outcomes compared to the uh, seminal uh, Checkmate 067 trial of melanoma as well. So, uh, you know, I'd like to think uh, like to say that, you know, our cohort is fairly representative of, you know, what is, I suppose, um, out there. And um, not surprisingly, we, we see that responders uh, have a high mutation, so uh, patients who have a resist response, a radiological response, uh, you know, classified by either a, a tumor shrinkage of more than 30%. Um, they have a higher tumor mutational burden. Um, although, you know, also consistent with the literature is that even if you do have a tumor mutational burden of more than 10, it doesn't stratify for survival in a statistical significant manner. And, you know, and I know, you know, this melanoma is not the only cancer where tumor mutation burden is an imperfect biomarker because, it, you know, it certainly can misstratify, um, you know, patients in terms of response and non-response. Um, however, going forward, you know, one step further is uh, from mutational burden is uh, neoantigen burden, you know, which is purported to be, um, you know, one of the potential drivers of an immune related response. And here we see that, you know, um, responders are associated with, uh, uh, again, a higher no total neoantigen count, but in contrast to a total, neo, um, total mutation burden, it does uh, quite nicely segregate out um, uh, survival. Um, and what is also interesting is that the new antigen effect is really driven by MHC class two new antigens here. Um, so this, the plot here on the left is, you know, all clonal new antigens. The one in the middle is if we did class MHC class one and the far on, one on the far uh, right is MHC class two, which has the um, most significant, um, you know, p-value. And I think, you know, we also know from uh, previous preclinical work that um, MH, uh, MHC class one and class two, uh, which are respectively recognized by CD8 and CD4 T cells. Uh, both of these cell types in HC class size are actually uh, required and it works synergistically in order to enact an uh, immunotherapy response. So I think, you know, it's very interesting, you know, that our data uh, in supportive of other, um, you know, published work as well, uh, you know, shows that you know, the importance of MHC class two new antigens prediction. Um, and then from, I guess, the other flip side of new antigen uh, immunogenicity, is then you know the uh, immune uh, infiltrate itself, and uh, other studies have sh have uh, shown that tumor purity um, is a, maybe a surrogate of immune infiltration, and of course tumor purity can also account for other cell types like stroma, but um, you know uh, but but it, 
in our hands here and also in other studies as well, um, we can see that tumor purity can also segregate response and non-response quite well uh, and also um, segregates uh, overall survival um, from you know, the, the start of first line treatment here. What is also really interesting that we observe is that as part of our um, you know, collaboration with all the NHS trusts, what we also asked uh, them to try to dig out for us was the primary pathology data from the melanoma um, primaries that, you know, that may have been occurring, you know, many years ago. So, so this is, you know, the sample that we have, um, but this is the uh, melanoma uh, primary histopathology data that we asked them to get to, you know, try to retrieve for us. And what is interesting is that uh, even just based on the primary pathology report, um, so this is not, uh, so this is just purely based on the uh, pathologist report and rather than a computational um, uh, quantification, but what we can, what we are seeing a suggestion in a very compelling trend is that patients who had a brisk tumor infiltrating lymphocyte infiltrate on their primary uh, histopathology melanoma, which may have occurred five, 10 years ago, can actually potentially predict response in the immune uh, checkpoint inhibitor setting, you know, a number of years later, suggesting that, you know, maybe over time there is this, you know, retention of this immunogenicity. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, you know, we also see that copy number alterations are, um, you know, important in melanoma progression. Um, as we can see, as we go from invasive melanoma to metastasis, the number of copy number alterations increase um, uh, in sort of matched uh, lesions. And also with CDKN2A uh, loss and ho uh, homozygous deletion, this also increases significantly as you progress from benign Levi to invasive melanoma. And so inspired by these, um, you know, copy number alterations in melanoma oncogenes, we also find that CDKN2A, which is a, a cell cycle um, uh, a gene with homozygous deletion, if if a, so if a melanoma sample had a homozygous deletion in the CDKN2 way, it's associated with significantly reduced um, response rate. Um, and then also with a TERT a gain, which is a um, telomerase, um, it was also associated with a, a, a reduced response rate. And then finally, we incorporated all of these um, uh, uh, predictors together in a multivariate genomic predictor. And, and we have, uh, you know, and I suppose we do have a couple of other uh, predictors that we're working on. Of course, we're also looking at validation as well. Um, but what we have sort of brought together is this uh, genome predictor that seems to have a similar AUC of 0.83, um, if you recall from the, from the previous uh, combination of TMB plus interferon gamma uh, signature. So, you know, so I suppose what we hope to show is that, you know, if you interrogate the whole genome and the genome if with more detail, you can actually, you know, you can actually potentially um, produce something that is equivalent to a TMB plus an interferon gamma signature. And that in itself might actually be also resource saving, or we could also incorporate this predictor into the uh, genomic plus transcriptomic predictor to potentially improve it. Um, and so on that note, I would just wrap up there and just say a big thank you to, you know, all the clinicians across the NHS Trust that collaborated with us to try to get the data together. Um, and of course, the support from Agile and of course, um, my, co uh, my colleagues in the laboratory and my uh, uh, supervisor, Samra and uh, Irene. Cool. All right, Ben. Thank you very much for that. Uh, so we are at time. Uh, I mean, I would love to kind of talk to you about this for ages, Ben. It's amazing yep. that you're doing this. Uh, it's great to see, uh, but unfortunately we are at time. So um, thank you all for joining us uh, for the Early Career Researchers Lightning Talks. Uh, it's a very brief run through some really interesting work that uh, some very early career researchers are using the gel data for. Um, and hopefully seen an insight into what is available within GEL and also kind of how we're supporting early career researchers. Um, so thank you all. Uh, enjoy your summers off and uh, we'll hopefully see you all in person at the GER Summit in September. Thank you all very much. <laughs>